Chapter Fifty Four of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Fifty Four, Confectuoso Caprizio. Pasco Pepperell did not recover. The shock had been too great. It had sent the blood rushing to his head, and his consciousness never returned. By midnight, he was a dead man. Now that he was gone, the will, made partly in a moment of scare partly out of compunction, partly also out of boastfulness, came into force, and Kitty was provided with a small income of her own. The first thing done by her and her aunt, as soon as the will was proved, was to refund to the insurance company the whole of the money paid by them to Pasco on account of the burned stores. The sellers belonged now to Zira for her life. It was not long before an understanding was reached between Walter Bramber and Kitty, the purport of which was that next spring Kitty should cease to be alone. No inscription, such as the girl had desired, had been cut in the bark of the mulberry tree, and now, were one to be traced there, it would be of a different nature, a legend of two who met and parted, and met again never more to part. Jason Quorm for once had succeeded in a speculation. The Torquay Building Society promised to be a prosperous company, and to pay good dividends. Jason was not able to contribute much in capital, but as promoter of the scheme he received certain shares. He was occupied, his mind engrossed in carrying out the plans of the company, in making contracts, in buying materials, in supervising, in altering, the scheming terraces and detached villas, in planting bell views, and sea prospects, and rosebank cottages, and lavender walks, and marine parades, and he could afford no time to be at Coombe. Zira was wrapped up in her niece. She could not have loved her more dearly had Kitty been her own child. The hardness in the woman's character gave way. The trouble she had undergone had softened and sweetened a nature really good and kind, but ruffled and soured by adverse circumstances and uncongenial associations. A great change had taken place in the opinion of the public in Coombe in Tynehead relative to Kitty. The general feeling was that she had been hardly treated— in having a crime attributed to her of which she had been guiltless. That she had been reserved in her manner, it was her way, and all folks were not constituted alike. That if she asked questions, no one was bound to answer them unless he liked, and if he couldn't give the required information. Kitty was quiet. She harmed nobody. She had done Rose Ash a great favor in stepping out of the way when Jan Pook was inclined to make a fool of himself with her. She was worth three thousand pounds for certain, and it was said that her father was piling up a fortune in Torquay. Coombe Cellars would ultimately be hers, as well as the little bit of ground about it, or rather, at the back of it, which was what remained of the farm. And she had been grown in Coombe, she had a foothold there, and all knew the worst to her, and that weren't so cruel bad. Finally, and conclusively, Mr. Puttacombe pronounced in her favour, so public opinion veered round, and was prepared to make much of Kate. The worst that could be spoken of her was that she had taken up with that schoolmaster again. But then, just as Scripture said that the believing wife might sanctify the heathen husband, so it was reasoned that the indigenous Kitty might naturalize the foreign Walter, and that because she belonged to the place, he might be accepted as a strange plant, given room to root in at Coombe. It was very well known that sometimes a stray cat came to a house from nobody knew where, and meowed, entreating to be fed and harbored, and few housewives would shut it out. They would take in the stranger, give it milk, and a place by the fire, and domesticate it. Even so came this Walter Bramber into Coombe out of space. Whom he had belonged to, and from what sort of habitation, no one knew. He asked to be domiciled in Coombe, and Kitty took him in. What was allowable to a cat was surely not to be refused to a schoolmaster. If Walter Bramber was afflicted with superior education, it was probably no more his fault than is water on the brain in a rickety child. And if he was a schoolmaster by profession, perhaps it was not his fault but his misfortune. He'd been bred to it by his unfeeling and unnatural parents, just as in London some boys were brought up to be thieves and pickpockets. Mr. Puttacombe, indeed, had taken up schoolmastering, but that was a different matter. 
He had not been reared to anything of the sort, and had adopted it rather as a pastime than a profession, and had never allowed it to interfere with his robust and intelligent pleasures, such as cockfighting. And Mr. Puddicombe drank and smoked, and swore sometimes, and all that showed he was a man. On the whole, Coombe and Tynehead agreed to accept Walter Bramber and Kitty as his wife, with the proviso that it would kick them over should they attempt to give themselves airs. As for the rector, he was radiant with happiness. Now at last he saw some prospect of making an impression for good on his parishioners, if not of elevating the existing generation, of greatly raising the moral and intellectual tone of that which would follow. He had striven hard for years in isolation and with absolutely no success. Now, with the aid of a peculiarly well-qualified schoolmaster, and with Kitty at that master's side to direct the girls as Bramber guided the minds of the boys, he was sanguine of success, not of much that he would see himself, but of a success in the far future. Of no profession can that be said more truly than that of the pastor. One soweth, another reapeth. Walter, he said to his schoolmaster, I was not sent here to blow Sunday soap bubbles, sometimes iridescent emptiness, sometimes emptiness without the iridescence. Soap bubbles please for the moment, but they do not satisfy. No father, the gospel says, when asked for bread, will give his children a stone, but a stone has in it substance, whereas a soap bubble has but emptiness. But the children will not ask for bread unless they be hungry, and will always be pleased to see soap bubbles sail over their heads. I believe the apostles were sent forth to be the salt of the earth. Their successors are self-satisfied if they be but insipid carbonate of soda. I have striven to feed, not to amuse, but nothing can avail till hunger come. You find that in the school, I find it in the church. Some Indians chew clay because they have not bread. Our people have quite a fancy for this stodgy substance. We have to rectify their appetites, so that they may come to desire nourishing diet, and not what is merely stuffing, to seek for instruction and not amusement. You in your sphere, I in mine, have a similar office, and similar obligations weighing on us, and similar difficulties to encounter. If you seek for popularity, make Puddicombe your model. Take the level of the people among whom you are set, and do not stir to cure them of clay chewing. If you seek to do your duty, then do not expect to have a path of soft herbage to tread, but one of thorns. If I had been indefinite, flowery, hollow in my teachings here, I should have been the most popular man in the parish, and after forty years' menstruation would have passed away with a smile of self-satisfaction that I had given no offence to any one, only to awaken the vast beyond to the startling conviction that I had done no good to any one. Cast your bread on the waters, and you will find it after many days. Cast chaff, and it will be blown, washed, rotted away. Many a man in my profession, and in yours, we are both teachers, is like the cuckoo spittle insect, which throws out a great froth bubble about it. So do some of my profession who surround themselves with a copious discharge of words, words without substance. Avoid that in your school, Bramber. Teaching must be definite, or it is trifling, not teaching and in sacred matters trifling is a guilty desertion of a duty. We are sent to feed, not befool our flocks. Form a clear conception in your mind of what you want to teach, and then impress it sharply, well defined, on the minds given you to act upon. So only will you rear a generation in advance of that to which we belong. But you will get no praise for so doing, save from your own conscience." Roger Redmore had surrendered to justice, by the advice of Jason, and he had been sentenced to nominal punishment of two months' imprisonment. Mr. Pook had readily pleaded for him, and frankly acknowledged that the man had been greatly aggravated, and was perhaps hardly sensible of what he was doing. On leaving prison, Roger was taken, along with his wife, into the service of the cellars, and gave promise of being a faithful and energetic workman. The spring arrived in course, and with the warm May air and flowers came the day of Kitty's marriage. There had been grave discussions among the instrumentalists of the village orchestra previous to the event, as to how it was to be honored by their performance. In compliment to the ex-schoolmaster, 
who took a lively interest in the marriage, it was unanimously decided that Puttacombe in F should be performed, if not in its entirety, at all events in part. The fug, it was thought, might be omitted, as only a critical and scientific musician could appreciate its merits and disentangle the chaos of sounds. But there was the Largo Molto Confeccioso Capriccio at their disposal. As Largo Molto meant, turn the score upside down, then if the score were not inverted, it would flow in the melody of Kitty Alone and I. Mr. Puttacombe was approached with the demand whether it were permissible to execute the movement without the Largo Molto, i.e., the inversion of the score. Puttacombe at once assented. That, as he pointed out, was the magnificent brilliancy of the composition, and that it could be turned about anyhow, and played right off, and the effect was superb anyway. Let them disregard Largo Molto, and simply play Con Affeccioso Capriccio, which meant, go ahead with a score upright, and there you are. Accordingly, after the ceremony, when the bride and bridegroom issued from the church, the orchestra, which was in readiness, struck up the movement of Puttycombe in F, Con Affeccioso Capriccio, and most certainly, as it so stood on the score, and so was performed, the air was none other than The Frog and the Mouse, Cock of My Daisy, Kitty Alone. Forward marched the band, playing hotboy, clarinet, first fiddle, second fiddle, the bass laboring along as best as he could, tumbling over his viol, throwing out a grunt and a growl when he was able. The people of Coombe and Tynehead were at their doors wishing happiness to the young couple. The children strewed flowers, and every now and then broke into chorus, Cock of my daisy kitty alone. The plowmen whistled the air and waved their caps. The church bells burst out into clamor and drowned it. The rooks in the elms of the churchyard poured forth volleys of caw, 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 introducing a new element into the musical melody. Through the street went the little procession, headed by children, who danced and sang before the band. Then came the musicians, lastly the married young people. They were on their way to the cellars, where Zero was waiting for them, and had brought forth cake and ale in abundance, to feast children, musicians, well-wishers, every one who would drink to the health of bride and bridegroom. Then, when the regaling was over, and thundering cheers had been given for the schoolmaster, for Kitty, for Zira, Walter Bramber and Kitty appeared at the door, and half singing, with a smile on his face, to the strain of The Frog and the Mouse, Walter thus tendered his thanks. Curtsy, Kitty, and say with me, Neighbors, thanks for company. On all the world we will shut the door. In all the world I need nothing more Than Kitty, my wife, and Kitty alone, Kitty alone and I. End of chapter 54 and the end of Kitty Alone by Sabine Bearing Gold Read for LibriVox by Marianne Spiegel in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you to Ellie for proof listening this book, to Andy Minter for introducing me to the works of Sabine Bearing Gold, and to you for listening. <laughs>